In the previous lesson, you learned how to compute individual cell available energy and available power. The available energy computation was quite straightforward, but the available power calculation required a little bit more development. In this lesson, you're going to learn instead how to compute battery pack available power and available energy instead. That is, you will learn how to compute these quantities for a battery pack that comprises many cells wired together. You're going to see that computing available power for the battery pack is quite straightforward after you've learned how to compute the power for a single cell. Computing available energy involves a bit more of a thought process, but in the end it's still not very difficult. So let's begin. Let's begin by looking at how to compute battery pack available power. Remember from last lesson that the HPPC method to compute cell discharge power evaluated the expression that the discharge power is equal to the minimum permitted cell voltage multiplying the present open circuit voltage minus the minimum voltage, all divided by the effective discharge resistance. In this equation, I have slightly updated notation from what you saw in the last lesson by adding the subscript J so that we can remember that this is now a multi-cell battery pack and this power is being computed at the cell level for the time being for a certain cell indexed by J in this battery pack. So I've had to update the voltage and the current symbols by now denoting them as V sub J and I sub J and also the state of charge by denoting it as Z sub J. When computing power in a series-connected multi-cell battery pack, we still consider the limiting condition to be when any cell voltage encounters either the minimum cell voltage for discharge and the maximum cell voltage for charge. So for discharge, the value V min in the power equation does not change, but the allowed current can change because individual cells might have different limiting currents. And in a series connected battery pack, the same current flows through every cell. And so we cannot permit more discharge current to flow through the battery pack than can be permitted by the weakest cell, if you will, the one that can permit the minimum amount of discharge current. So when computing pack power, we sum the individual cell powers. So we add up the power that is delivered as voltage times current for each cell when we recognize that the current is going to be the same for every cell, but must be the minimum for all of the currents that are permitted by the HPPC method for individual cells that we talked about last time. And so you can see in this equation here, the discharge power is the sum over all of the cells in series of the voltage of that cell, which we're setting to be V min, and the current for that cell, which we're setting to be the minimum over all of the currents allowed for all of the cells of OCV minus V min divided by the discharge resistance of that cell. Using the same reasoning for computing charge power for the battery pack, we compute the charge power as the sum over all cells of the maximum permitted voltage multiplying the current for that cell. And since charge power is negative and charge current is negative, instead of taking the minimum to get the minimum absolute value, to get the minimum absolute value, we actually have to take the maximum. The maximum of two negative numbers has the minimum negative value, which is why you see the max in this equation on the slide. And that's all there is for computing battery pack power using the HPPC method. Now we move on to look at how do we compute battery pack total energy. Remember that cell total energy is computed as the full charge capacity of the cell multiplying the open circuit voltage relationship integrated between the minimum permitted state of charge and the present operating state of charge. Often we said this could be approximated simply as the capacity multiplying the nominal voltage multiplying change in state of charge. When computing total energy for a multi-cell battery pack, we have to remember that every cell could have a different total charge capacity and could have a different present state of charge. So computing battery pack available energy is a three-step process. First, we have to determine how much charge could be removed from the battery pack before any cell encounters its minimum state of charge. Consider the drawing on the right. The 
left part of the drawing shows the present condition of the battery pack. One of the cells in this drawing is fully charged and the other cell is at a slightly lower state of charge. What we're doing with this first step is performing a thought experiment, not a physical experiment. And in our thought experiment we ask how much charge could be removed from this series connected battery pack before any of these cells is discharged to the level Z min. And that's the state that's shown on the right side of the drawing. To compute the amount of charge we can remove, we begin with the generic state of charge equation uh, that we saw in the previous lesson that says that state of charge now is equal to some initial state of charge minus the quantity of ampere hours discharged and then divided by the total charge capacity. Next in our thought experiment, we substitute the present state of charge for the initial state of charge because that's where the battery pack on the left side of the drawing is beginning. And then we set the final state of charge to be the minimum state of charge. Uh, and then we set the capacity equal to the capacity of this cell under consideration. This is in order to figure out how many ampere hours of charge can I remove from each cell starting at its present state of charge to see how, uh, to see how many it takes to get down to the minimum state of charge. We rearrange the expression to find that the ampere hours discharged are equal to the capacity multiplying the present state of charge minus the minimum state of charge for any of the cells. So the maximum amount of charge that could be withdrawn from the battery pack before the weakest of the cells is discharged to Z-min is the minimum of all these which is given by this equation here. The equation tells us the maximum number of ampere hours that we can discharge before any cell encounters the minimum SOC limit. So that's how much charge is possible to remove from the battery pack. But if we were to remove this many ampere hours from the battery pack, only one cell would end up at state of charge Z-min. All of the other cells would end up at slightly higher states of charge. So to compute the amount of energy removed each individual from each individual battery cell, we, we have to use the energy relationship from its own starting state of charge to its own ending state of charge using this accumulated number of ampere hours removed. And the ending state of charge is equal to the beginning state of charge minus the quantity of charge removed divided by the total capacity of that cell. So we're going to call that the Z-low, the low state of charge after this thought experiment, after removing as much uh, charge as we can from the battery pack, where Z-low is going to be Z-min for one cell, but it's going to be somewhat above Z-min for the other cells. So now we can compute the amount of energy removed for each cell and the amount of energy for the battery pack. The amount of energy removed from the battery pack is the sum of all the energies removed from the cells. And this equation shows the computation. You can see that the pack energy is the summation over all of the cells in the battery pack of the quantity where we multiply the capacity of that cell by the integrated open circuit voltage relationship where we integrate between the present state of charge and the low state of charge for that cell. Now remember it's not possible to extract all of this energy at high rates and cold temperatures because of the resistances of this cell and that's why we needed the power estimates as well to tell us how quickly we can extract this energy. When we compute the energy estimate, there's an integral equation involved that might look somewhat frightening, but this integral relationship can be pre-computed offline and stored in a lookup table for essentially instant computation in a real-time environment. On this slide, you can see a block of code that's written in the programming environment for MATLAB or for Octave. This particular code will work in either. And this code has uh, two sections. One section performs this integral approximation and stores it in a lookup table. And the second part of the code looks up a value from that table whenever we require it. In this code block, everything that has a percent symbol at the beginning of a line that's shaded in green is a comment to describe what's happening. It's not a functional line of code. It's there instead for the human being reading the code to understand better what the code is intended to do. 
So if we look at this, we see that in reality there are actually only two lines of code in what I'm showing you, and the rest is a description of what those two lines are doing. In the code, we're first assuming that a, a variable called zref exists in our workspace, and that a vector of state of charge points at which we want to compute values for the lookup table, um, that, that's what it is. Uh, so as an example, this vector might contain points between some minimum state of charge and 100% state of charge in increments of 1% state of charge. The variable OCVVEC is a vector of open circuit voltage values that have been computed somewhere else for the cell uh, that we're considering and correspond one to one with the state of charge points in ZREF as the open circuit voltage values at those states of charge. And based on those values, we would like to integrate the open circuit voltage relationship versus state of charge for, the, for that particular range of state of charge points. The code that performs that operation uh, uses a command called cumtrapz, which performs a trapezoidal integration cumulatively, cumulatively over the points in OCVVEC uh, as related to the points in ZREF. The figure shows the result of this computation for the six different cells you saw earlier where their OCV relationships were plotted for you at that point. In this graph, the two lines at the bottom correspond to the two iron phosphate cells that had slightly lower open circuit voltage than the other four cells. The other four lines that are nearly on top of each other in this integra integrated relationship are for the other four cells of lithium manganese oxide and lithium cobalt oxide and nickel manganese cobalt oxide. The integrated OCV relationships are nearly but not quite linear. So we see that the approximation uh, to the integral of nominal voltage multiplying a change in state of charge would not always be very inaccurate. Sometimes it's a pretty good approximation. But if you were to hold a straight edge up to this slide, you would notice that there is some curvature, especially in the top four. And for the best accuracy, you would perform the computation that now you see how to do using the code on this slide. So this first line using cumtrap z forms the integrated relationship. And if we want to use this integrated relationship in a lookup table, we use the next line of code that you see on this slide. We want to perform a table lookup into the table that has um, one column is ZREF, those are the state of charge points at which the table exists, and the other is the um, integrated values that we called IVZREF. Uh, in MATLAB and an octave, table lookup is performed by the interp1 function, which performs simple linear interpolation. And this command produces integrated voltage as a function of state of charge, or what I'm calling in the code IVZ, using interpolation with this table defined by ZREF on the horizontal axis and IVZ ref on the vertical axis. Uh, since ZREF does not go below Z min, we have to be careful uh, not to try interpolating into this table using arguments that are less than Z min, which is why you can see in the input to the interp1 command, I have max z min comma z to make sure that the input argument is never actually below z min. You could also do something similar to make sure that the input argument was never greater than one by using a min of z max comma z or a min one comma z in there to uh, enforce that it was always less than one. So overall, I hope that now that you have seen this code, you agree that computing this integrated open circuit voltage is not especially difficult, and that using it is also not especially difficult in an application. To summarize what you've learned in this lesson, you can now compute estimates of battery pack power over some future time horizon, and you can also compute estimates of battery pack energy by expanding on the methods that you learned last lesson for single cells. You've also seen the first example written in MATLAB code or octave code that is able to implement a lookup table. And while we applied it to the example of computing energy, the basic principle of computing and implementing a lookup table is quite general, and we will find it to be very useful throughout the specialization. 
Uh, this lesson has brought you to the end of our discussion of requirement um, three placed on battery management systems of performance management. We'll spend much more time examining other methods to estimate state of charge and available power in the battery pack in courses three through five of the specialization. And the methods that you learn turn out to be better than what you've learned so far. But the methods that you have learned so far give you a good basis for understanding the general ideas involved and are sometimes used in practice even now. So the remainder of this week will be devoted to considering the battery management system requirement which has to do with diagnostics.